This is a first dialogue between Tim Kubik, an educational consultant and friend who I've shared many years with in a community run by Lisa Norton. And Tim has a deep sensibility for the creativity of uncertainty and has also spent many, many years working in the space of education as a consultant, writing a book on the subject and brings a depth of history to bear on the question of what is education? Where has it come from? How has it been shaped by the state and by industry? And why does education look the way it does now? And alongside Tim, I'm pleased to bring my friend O.G. Rose, philosopher and writer, and somebody who has really helped me to think about education in an adult and lifelong context. And what does it mean for us to become a kind of educational entrepreneur and to nurture new forms of education in these online scenes and communities um, that are more fitted to our souls becoming. And so, yeah, I really welcome you to this meandering deep dive conversation. We touch on leisure, we touch on the market, we touch on the impact of AI on education, the ways in which this could both break and reinforce the brokenness of the educational institutions. And uh, finally, we touch on the significance of Zoom and aspects of the liminal web as a potential seedbed for a new kind of education. So with that, welcome to the conversation. Yeah, please feel free to, to pick that up, Daniel. Oh, I, I just really like what Tim was saying on the idea that we still live kind of in the 20th century because, well, because we too much then focus on sequence as just like linear time. Oh, this is later, therefore it's future. When really, if you still have the same mindset and still mm -hmm. value things every according to exchange, has there really been any kind of change really other than just a passage of time? And I just think what he's getting at, like what he's saying so much where Tim is talking about, we still have an exchange mindset. I love that idea of cocktail party knowledge. I've just called it kind of trivia knowledge after Postman. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me think of the glass bead game by, um, by, uh, by, oh, his name escapes me. Uh, he did, uh, Thomas Mann? So, 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 what's that, sir? Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann, he was friends with him, and he wrote Siddhartha and uh, Steppenwolf and uh, Herman Hesse. Herman Hesse. Yeah, that's Herman the man. Hesse. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and that book is hilarious because it's like education becomes basically a, a trading of glass beads, you know. Right. <laughs> and so you have this similar structure where now you are educated to the degree that you're able to exchange information with people as opposed to be internally transformed by what you learn. Well, here's the issue. Like the right. only way to actually have a true change in history has to have some sort of internal transformation, not just external um, social positioning. Um, and then to, you know, to kind of close the point, um, my beloved uh, Bernard Hankins, he did a, you may, I'd, I'd highly suggest that he did a wonderful TED talk talking about people of colors. And what he was talking right. about is how education today actually kind of cuts out people who think in terms of colors like different ways of learning, different modes of learning. And we did a lot with kind of introducing like the hip hop cypher and talking mm -hmm. about cypher tank, not just the think tank, where you bring in a bunch of kids who are doing like the hip hop cypher to come up with ideas in this kind of accelerated mm -hmm. associational logic and how that actually then made kids feel valued because, wow, I learned how to be able to do this free flow cypher thinking. Um, and then I'm able to bring it into a context where people value it. But I think what you're getting at right there points to why we tend to bias exchange education is because exchange education, we know, we kind of basically know that it's not going to do but so much. You start talking about bringing in a cipher or people of colors or different ways of thinking. Oh, man, who knows what we could end up? You know, it's kind of scary to people. What ideas could come out of this? What might happen that we have to respond to? But you see, that's the truth of creativity. Creativity always has to have this possibility of shattering everything or opening up new possibilities, which then we have to have the kind of character or 
uh, subjectivity or ability to handle that uncertainty. Otherwise, whatever we call creativity is still going to be in the mode of production or mode of exchange that is the cocktail party. And we may call it creativity, but really it's just going to be moving around chairs on the Titanic, dare I say, or just moving things around without making any real change. And I really like that idea that history doesn't really progress uh, if that's all you're doing until there's this breaking through of real creativity, I almost want to say the event in a kind of Bedouin and say like until that occurs, you're not really advancing historically. It's just a, a change in clock time. I think that's really good. Yeah. And I, I was just looking at a um, RFP that the Texas Education Agency has put out for working with open educational resources. Right. And it's exactly that rearranging of deck chairs that you're talking about, right? They're calling for an innovative way to develop teachers facility of working with these tools, but they've got everything planned out already in terms of what they want teachers to be doing, right? Um, and their quote unquote innovation is working with open educational resources instead of textbooks, but they're doing the exact same thing with OER that they would be doing with textbooks. So they're not really doing anything different other than, um, you know, saving a lot of money because they don't have to buy textbooks for the district because they're working in an OER space, right? Which is not insignificant, right? But the, the, the instructional methodologies aren't changing at all. Um, and I, I like what you said a lot, Daniel, about uh, the change needing to be internal as well as external, right? And I, I do think that's been the biggest obstacle to, um, to really imagining a 21st century education uh, model because we're constantly thinking about it still in terms of changes that will have an impact on the external without admitting that some of those changes are going to have to have a big impact on the internal, not only of the kids or the teachers and the actors in the system, but also of the elements of the system and the system itself, right? That um, and, and we're completely unwilling to consider any fundamental changes to the elements of the system itself, um, I, I think in part because we still are focused on that transactional approach. And, you know, this is nothing new. We've been criticizing it since Dewey, like you said. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if you you know um, Sam Weinberg's book, Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. Interesting. Um, hmm. Sam's an historian of American history. So he's an historian of the teaching of American history in high school and college, right? Really interesting guy. Um, and I'm an historian, so I, I resonated with that work rather than maybe a similar kind of work in a different subject area. Um, but what, he's, what he really goes through is what a radical transformation um, teaching history in American public schools went through in the teens and 20s, right? Uh, that really changed a lot of internal things to the system in order to create this melting pot narrative and American exceptionalism and all that, right? Um, that that previously, I mean, there were a lot of political turmoils because to what extent American public schools existed, there was no grand narrative that brought people together, right? Um, there were lots of languages being spoken. I think we're at a moment like that now again, where most public schools and urban areas have 50 to 60 languages being spoken in the school. Um, there is no grand narrative that holds them together. Um, but I don't think that means we need a new grand narrative. I think it means we need to go back to wrestling with what we were wrestling before and admit the politics into the system, right? Rather than try to pretend that there's some way to take the politics out of education. I think that's very well put. I'll have to read that book. That sounds extraordinary. Right. I've been um, wonderful. I, I've been speaking with the great Michelle Bowens and uh, getting on the work that he does, P2P Foundations, kind of the new commons. We walk on like Ivan Illich, as you know, he does that famous book on de-schooling education. He also really kind of talks about the idea of um, learning webs, the idea of opening up new kind of structures of thinking, because the point is like, we don't really have, there's a lot of talk today about decentralization. And mm -hmm. um, decentralization doesn't occur if everyone's still using the same mode of thinking. Like decentralization to truly be decentralization as opposed to mere difference of the same kind would require different, dare I say, epistemological experiments, different experiments of form right. or openness to different formulations of how learning looks like. You know, 
it's very interesting when we look at like book seven of the Republic with Plato, I think it's really important to understand that when Plato talks about forms, it's not this idealized perfection, but it's more like the orbit of a planet that a thing formulates according to. Right. That's why he's always talking about geometry. So you almost in education need a, dare I say, competition or decentralization or different ways of formulation of which requires different ways of thinking. Because if that does not occur, no matter what innovation, creativity, whatever you want to call it, it's all occurring in basically a trivia mindset, an exchange mindset, a cocktail mindset. So then it is going to necessarily um, just make more solid class differences or ways of thinking differences. It's not going to change anything. But the problem, and this is where Ivan Illich is so interesting, precisely because it's then open to everyone, it seems democratic and therefore wherever anyone ends up in their class positioning is then their responsibility and their fault, if you will. But since it right. actually in its structure shuts out different modes of thinking, the people who have different modes of thinking are at a disadvantage because of the structure itself. But then those differences are put forth as being a democratic meritoc meritocratic um, reorganization. And that's like, you know, Dr. Sandel will talk about that. Um, and we, who did what money can't buy and justice and all those books. And he has a wonderful series. Um, and so that's a real problem because like, for example, like just talking with Bernard, you'd have these, I was always amazed by these kids who, if you get them in the cipher and say, go, they're able right. off the dome to be the most incredible explosion of creative and associational genius you have ever seen. And yet they would not be considered intelligent. You know, they would right. not be considered smart because that doesn't fit into a structure. The great irony, though, is um, I would argue that if we want to talk about one of the virtues of capitalism is supposed to be the notion of invention and creativity. Well, that more so aligns with the cipher mentality than it right. does the exchange mentality. And the funny thing that is occurring, this kind of fundamental irony, is that in the name of the markets and business, you are closing off the modes of thinking that tend to create the most creativity and innovation that is supposed to be the crown jewel of capitalism. But then the modes of education mm. are actually counterintuitive or contradictory to that very mode because it would require changing our habits, assumptions preset notions of what constitutes learning to be more open to creativity, which then would have to also make us willing to put at risk the um, the class differences, the class structures that we've created and built society around. And that's really hard. And the ones who benefit from it tend to make the decision so they don't tend to uh, be so open right. well, to and, those and, possibilities. And that's what I was that's why I'd say that the, the system functions exactly as it was designed to function, right? It's not contradictory or counterintuitive. Um, the assumption was always that our public school system, for the vast majority of kids, would be a um, normalizing, standardizing experience that would make them fungible widgets that could go to any industrial setting, whether it's a factory or a corporate office or whatever, right? Um and and that a few kids might rise to the top and pop out of that uh, because they're able to play the game of school really, really well in a way that is creative to the people who run the game of school. Key point, right? So they get bumped up into different spaces when that happens. Um, and we see that with people like Jeffrey Canada and, um, you know, the... Um, the no excuses charter schools, right? Where like kids who follow the rules all the way and are innovative within that space, right? They're good rule followers, but they are able to be innovative without transgressing the rules. Like they'll get sent to Harvard from these no excuses charter schools, right? Um, and, and the kids who want to challenge the rules of the system because they frustrate their creativity, right? They get pushed out into nowhere. So I, I would argue, you know, that uh, and it was pretty intentional, I think, in the Committee of Ten in the 1880s when they were setting mm. up the American public school system. It, it was pretty intentional um, that they were trying to create a public school system uh, that could basically perpetuate the American social economic structure as it was at the beginning of the 1900s, right? Um, that there were some kids who were able to get a different kind of education either through private schools or occasionally through uh, religious schools. Uh, the vast majority of kids would get enough public education that they might rise to a manager class, but never any higher than that, right? Um, 
And it it's um I think it's a twofold pressure at the end of the 20th century was like this whole notion that if we're going to be competitive globally, we have to open that game up to more people. Right. Uh, that in fact, you know, I mean, there was the fact bantied around that, you know, there are more gifted and talented kids in China than there are kids in the American public school system. Right. So if we're going to compete with, with China's select population that pops out of their school system or India's right we have to have something that allows every kid the possibility of breaking out of the the rules and being creative. Um, so I think that was a part of the trajectory. And then I think as we've been talking about earlier, um, I think uh, the diversity and equity question became a real question also in American politics, right? That um, you'd had a generation from the first civil rights movement that had been able to do that breakout right and go from okay, okay you're a person of color you can get a job as a manager somewhere right to you're a person of color and you can be a ceo of a major american corporation right um but um but people of color weren't satisfied with the opportunities they were getting on a whole and so they started to question the system more broadly and i think um you know jonathan kozel's work on inequity in the american public education system um uh, now I can't think of the name of his big book that came out in 1999, but it sort of it sort of broke open the sense that the system was completely rigged to perpetuate American class and social structures, um, and that no matter what we tried to do to change it, um, savage inequalities—that's the name of the book. Hmm. Um, but there was nothing we were going to do to change it, right? Because it, it, not only was the school system rigged, but the legislative system, the school districting systems, right? Like all overlapped in interesting ways that guarantee that basically, you know, um, uh, Northern Virginia was always going to produce the cream of the crop and the rest of Virginia was going to go work in factories, right? That that was, that that was just the way it was going to work, right? Mm -hmm. All those school districts had some lenience in the system and tended to propel more people up, but they were predominantly white. They were pre predominantly suburban, right? And if you grew up in a rural district or you grew up in a district that was predominantly people of color, right? Like you just weren't going to get the same opportunities at all, right? So I, I really do think, um, you know, you hear a lot of people criticizing the industrial model of education, right? As though we should all realize uh, that it's bad and we should replace it. But in fact, it was built very specifically to perpetuate typical American notions of color and class. Um, and people aren't, as you mentioned, people aren't really willing to let go of that. I don't know if it's solely on fear. Um, I, I think it's because it produces a lot of privilege for a select group of people. Um, they're addicted to it. I feel like this is a really strong, like, <clears throat> I feel a deep concordance with what's been said about the way in which the industrial or post-industrial education system is, you know, directly downstream of the larger um, socioeconomic structure to which it serves. And speaking of colorful thinking, I feel like I've just had watercolors going all over the place as an explosion of different threads going on right now and it's a mm -hmm. testament to us if we can kind of keep binding the them together <laughs> because they're really going off in so many so many different directions um i was thinking about the uh you know the boy that you described daniel who has amazing skill and freestyle in rap cipher and how when he goes to work in a managerial class job which is straight and i really like that word straight tim because it has a double meaning it's not just like you know mm -hmm. sexual straight there's like straight like you know a suit like straights um the straightness of being inside of the box right so the straightness of the box is going to exclude all of that and i'm thinking to myself what are the kind of structures that are actually good at including all of those skills and something i've noticed just over the past year um is that churches particularly i encountered a number of like hispanic churches in san diego and i've seen some similar ones down here like modern churches and it's really incredible to me like the way in which they're able to simply organize people 
around some common purpose and they're like able to draw in like all of the skills of the young people they're not afraid to like get the kids involved the teenagers people are doing social media people are doing video people are doing music and all of it is kind of like serving this this common enterprise um part of the uh what's the phrase from belonging again so walter Lippmann says the acids of modernity have eaten away our quiet certainty they've been throwing away our givens and now our whole field of consciousness is trembling with uncertainties and those acids can a lot of those acids is to do with the primacy of capital capitalism um it's also forces like global communication mm -hmm. um and we can get further into that but in any case it seems to eat away the space of the civic uh the common space the space of uh you know where a carnival or a town town organizational things might emerge it eats away at the space of the church and then you kind of just get like education funneling into uh corporate capital cultivation oriented um structures and so part of what i'm looking back at in this conversation is like going deep medieval and thinking about what was the layout of education and medieval life and for a lot of people going into the corporations of the day which maybe was trades uh a lot of that stuff was actually happening outside of education you had trades happen inside of trades if you want even late, later into the industrial period i think this is true um your ability to work in an industry that's creating a craft or a good came about through going into that industry the educational space was much more philosophy civics and also like monasteries and spiritual education and things of this nature um so it's interesting to draw upon these different kind of imaginary pools to help us to get outside of the the box that i think you're really pointing to tim is like we, we keep trying to like okay we're gonna it's almost like a cliche of modern education is like time to think outside the box think outside the box uh, teachers always doing teaching reform and educational reform but it's always somehow outside of the box inside of another box um and so yeah, we're in a outside. space now of yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're in a space now where there's a possibility for uh a real educational entrepreneurs to start to create something that's not actually a school in any normative sense but in which education is happening and i think that's possibly one of the promises of the um the liminal web and the digital commons and these mm -hmm. different kind of online community these this kind of like third space that's holding I think with more integrity than anywhere else in culture right now, holding the depth of change that we're going through. And it's through that holding of the depth and change of uncertainty that we seem to actually be drawn more to. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to be the right skill uh, for the future. We can't say, oh, we need, we need coders or we need STEM um, or we need nuclear physicists or we need artists. There's a great, alan watts um bit about this where he's kind of like asked by i think he's asked by god like if you could engineer like which humans of the future would you pick and he goes through this process and it's like well we don't actually know which human's going to be needed for which condition because our climate is always changing sometimes it's the shamanic visionary sometimes it's the people with dexterous skill in doing crafts with their hands sometimes it's the mathematical people sometimes it's the relational people um so i'll, I'll leave it there <laughs> i got lots to say but go ahead daniel you're a gentleman tim uh first off i did want to confirm that when pe when people i ask so where are you from and they say virginia and I was like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, from Loud. And I'm like, oh, Virginia, huh? Uh, so Nor <laughs> Nova and Sova are very different things. Yes. Um, so it's quite funny. Um, you know, a few things come to mind. Um, it, it, it's, 
So there's this great question right now. So there's an irony at lurk in all of this. And I is that, you know, Keynes warned about the great stagnation where capitalism had this tendency to kind of stagnate, actually. And you have people like Tyler Cohn talk about the great stagnation. And you also see where, for example, it used to be that you could raise seven kids on one income and now you need two incomes to kind of uh, take care of one kid. Right. So the cost of living has skyrocketed. One of the great ironies is that um, actually when capitalism, what I would say, conflates the categories of produ produ productivity and creativity, which are not the same things, everyone actually loses. So yeah. what occurs is the very kind of kicking out the cipher mentality or the people of colors, as Bernard put it, in the name of increasing economic productivity actually destroys capitalism and leads to stagnation. But the problem is... So there's always this idea that in capitalism, OK, well, a rich guy getting rich doesn't necessarily make you poor because the entire pie is growing. Right. So that's kind of the logic. If the rich are making money, they're not necessarily taking it from everyone because the entire pie is growing. That argument is sound. But here's the issue. Creativity and product. The pie only grows if there's creativity. If there's productivity, then it's a zero sum game, not a non zero sum game. See, that's the main like if I were to give you like a very giant plane is to say that the big problem of economics, modern capitalism, is we've never asked the question, what is demand? Demand is always assumed. It is always there. Like in Keynes, you need to stimulate demand. Stimulating demand and, cre and uh, creating demand are conflated. But demand is actually created relative to the way people think, the way they carry their life. And so if people are taught, here's the key, if people are taught to only be capable of thinking in the mo the logic of capital, as Marx put it, or exchange, then that means demand is always a reflection of a logic of exchange. Here's the problem. Exchange only moves the pieces of the pie around. It does not grow the pie. So if your education system is only teaching people how to think in accordance with exchange, then you cannot grow the pie. And capitalism has to become a zero-sum game versus a non-zero-sum game. I do think there's evidence to show that if you have a capitalist system where people actually are creative, you can have the pie growth. We have periods of that in human history. But the problem is, the problem is, was the rumor of what I call autonomous freedom, which is the notion that if you just set people free, they will free, freely create wealth. Well, Adam Smith doesn't even say that, actually. There right. is no laissez-faire capitalism. That is, a, even hype comes around. And he's like, this doesn't exist. So freedom being, so here's the key. Freedom, being creative versus merely productive, is not something you can assume. Just because you make people free does not mean you can assume that they will thus create. They may only exchange. And actually, if the education system only makes people capable of thinking according to exchange, then you will not have wealth creation, only production, which is only a logic of exchange, which then means it must become a zero-sum game. And then the people right. in power are going to what? They're going to keep their privilege because there is no non-zero sum game. Well, if it's all zero sum right. game, then the people in power have to do everything in their power, which they have, to keep the parts of the pie to themselves. So the key to this is a lot of the arguments that you'll hear, in my opinion, between people favoring capitalism and people against it is an argument of, oh, it's non-zero sum or it's zero sum, the whole pie grows or people take the question of if the system is zero sum or non zero sum is basically entirely dependent on the education system because that has a massive impact on how people think so that they're able to think a distinction between productivity and creativity, which is a distinction that is necessary for there to be the possibility of a non zero sum game versus a zero sum game. Now, I'm not, now critically, I'm not saying that people listening to this talk then realize the distinction and everything will change. You know, that's what Marx is getting at when he says the fetish of capital. You can know that capital is all ridiculous and it's still, as an autonomous logic and it will still control your life. So I'm not saying this is just like, you know, and everything changes. There are still material conditions that have to be changed. But here's the key yeah. point. You can change the material conditions all you want. But if people still think the same way, those material conditions will come back. Because they're just going to bring them back because they're only able to think in according to the logic of exchange. So let's say you remove the material conditions of exchange, but you haven't changed the education system. So people are still right. thinking according to the logic of exchange. They're just going to bring back those same material conditions. Now I'm going to pass it on. This has gotten me very interested. I've been talking with David Theory Underground and all these other people, and I've been very interested in the labor theory of value versus the value form theory debate going on. And it seems to be... You know, this is the cheap part where the guy says it's both. Ah, we all love that, aren't it? But it is seemingly both. 
because what Marx is trying to describe, he's talking a sociological reality before sociology is a paradigm. And he's talking about how the idea of capital creates the society where capital is intelligible, which creates the idea of capital on and on and on. All of which, though, does seem to be a result of what stuff like Dietrich McClowski talks about, which is, you know, the great enrichment where you say, hey, people, work has dignity and people should be free to do the work that they want. And then people go off and invent a lot of things, which then creates a lot of wealth. But then the people who manage the wealth then come to facilitate the system as a solid thing to keep them on power. So a great right. enrichment then leads to a solidified system and you get the professional man managerial class, just like Buchanan talks about. So the key mm -hmm. here is to me, and then I'll pass. The big mistake is the assumption that basically capitalism creates wealth magically. Like if you just let people be free, then it will all work out. No, it right. has a lot to do with how people think. And if people are thought only in basically taught that edu that exchange is the only logic of thinking, well, then capitalism becomes zero sum, not non zero sum. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I, I want to pass it to you, Tim, right away, but I just want to quickly kind of throw a question in for you because I feel like you're really well positioned to, to bring some insight into this is like, how does contemporary progressivism of like the last 20 years kind of fit into this problem? Mm. Uh, as you've kind of spoken to, of like the, the zero sum capital system can like co opt and bring in people of different backgrounds, people of color, bring them into the same system without changing the underlying ways of thinking. And so there's this kind of weird tension of like a revolutionary further, like something's really mm -hmm. off, something's really unfair, we need to overthrow, we need to change. And then you have this kind of like technocratic, uh, weird. Uh, uh, a class of rulers who are like kind of in a dialogue with that and like changing their values uh, some ways in depth, but also superficially yeah. to kind of appease that and like co-opt it into staying with the same thing. But it doesn't seem to me clear, like where is the way for that whole like political wave and energy to actually open into this kind of creative space that, that Daniel's talking about we need. Yeah, well, it's a great question, right? And I have to say, as we're talking about um, elites maintaining their position of power in the system, like we're not having this conversation with all the big coats and big egos at Davos, right? Like, and we don't get invited to that conversation in any world, right? There's no world in which this conversation is allowed into that conversation. Um, and I, I want to echo some things that Daniel said, uh, because I think they're tremendously important, right? Um, if, if we, if we look at the late 19th century and the, the development of the public school system, right, it goes hand in hand at a time when the laissez-faire economists realized what Daniel said, right, is it's not natural. It doesn't happen. You don't just let people free and have things happen, right? You actually have to build labor markets, right? You have to educate for labor markets. You have to educate to convince a lot of people that they are in fact a commodity that can be traded and moved around on labor markets, right? Um, and you saw extremes of this uh, in um, in different varieties around the uh, around the world, right? Whether it was Bismarck sort of saying, you know what, we've got to have mass a suffrage. We got to have social welfare, democracy in order to create labor marts. We've got to change the way people think about their affiliation to what you were talking about earlier, Daniel, about like sort of the the public sphere of their local community or their local church, right? Because and France is a classic paradigm of this. The French government was never able to convince the French people to become a labor market in that time period, right? Um, they continue to insist that they wanted to work and manufacture on a small scale in their own local communities, uh, really until the First World War, forced them to you know, either learn how to do that or become subjects of the greater German empire, right? Um, but in the South of the United States, you also have this question, right? A lot of people think that the, the trick was of slavery was like you got free labor right but it wasn't about free labor at all it was about the fact that you were able slaves were actually human beings as capital right they, they were a profitable product right the average slave was worth the price of roughly an american car 
right? And if if you didn't need the labor, you could alienate it to somebody else who did. Those slaves were perfectly mobile human capital. And that's what the North was upset about because they couldn't quite figure out how to convince Northerners, white Northerners, to become part of the labor market, right? Um, <laughs> to be that fungible and that tradable, right? But I, I want to go back to something else that you were asking about, Daniel, because I think it's it really does speak to this, is that the to what Daniel was talking about, the, this, the education systems that we know over time are always going to be a product of their material conditions, right? As I mentioned, like laissez-faire, we forget this, laissez-faire really failed in the 1880s and 1890s across the world, right? It, liberals of the 19th century thought it was going to work. And then you had a bunch of economic crises that seriously short-circuited the system on the scale with the Great Depression, but not quite as bad as the Great Depression. So we tend to forget those crises of the 1880s and 1890s, right? And so you got people all over the world trying to imagine a new educational system um, that would create the conditions necessary for the labor markets. Um, and what they really did there was undo the educational system of the church right of the church and of the um uh mercantilist bureaucracies of the ancien regime right because that the education system we had for the church as you pointed out daniel was designed to produce literate scribes who could document knowledge all to the point of providing or proving the existence of god right the educational institutions of the ancien regime the the bureaucratic states of the 1600s, 1700s were all developed to do the same thing, but basically prove the existence of God in the form of the head of state, right? Um, whether it's, you know, Louis XIV or whether it's Frederick the Great, right? Where everything is about proving the sovereignty of the head of state. Right. And that wasn't a that was that was rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Because we just displaced God with a human head of state, right? But in the 19th century, you get this first attempt to create an education system that is for the benefit of capital, right? Which is a weird thing, right? It's not a God, it's not a person, right? It's this very obtuse concept. Um, and when that becomes really difficult at the end of the 19th century, then you get um, the Frankfurt School starting to come to a realization that there's actually a culture industry that produces the exchange mindset that Daniel's talking about, right? And so, um, you know, we we start seeing, uh, you know, G uh, Georg Simmel, a German sociologist who wrote The Philosophy of Money, talks about why um, sports are essential to capitalist societies, right? Because it's all about trading players to make the best teams. It's all about their stats, right? And if you're a good capitalist, you follow football stats or baseball stats or whatever, because you understand um, what eventually became the sabermetric stuff in baseball at the end of the 20th century, right? That like, this is all about trading people. Right. And so that shows that I'm captivated to a thinking mindset of capitalism because my favorite pastime is fantasy football leagues where I'm trading people to try to produce the most winning team. Right. I bought into the labor market notion that I, you know, I don't have to live anywhere. I don't have to have an attachment to any place. I go where I can make the most money. Right. And our public school systems were we're set up to do that on a national level in the United States. And I think it's true elsewhere around the country or around the world, right? But when globalization hit, the world had never tried to tackle that question. How do you get kids to realize that their best incentive is to move to Botswana? Right? Like, and the English did this a little bit at the end of the 19th century, right? They figured out a way to move their population of educated people all around through the colonial world of England. And I always love to share this fact. You know what the number one undergraduate major was in the United States in the year 1900? Colonial administration. Yeah, really. It was the number one undergraduate major. You're on mute, wow. Daniel. So, um, because we were starting to experiment with this idea of a global labor market, and then the two world wars broke it down completely, right? And the global lab labor market we got at the end of the Second World War was owned by the United States, right? I mean, there was no competition to the United States. The U.S. just sort of took over the global labor market. But we've watched that decline. Um, 
And the United States has been the producer in the culture industry of the mindsets and concepts that govern the global labor market for most of the late 20th century and into the 21st century. I think of Benjamin Barber's great book, Jihad versus McWorld, right? Like, you know, the United States marketed McWorld and other parts of the world were like, fuck that. Right. We don't want your culture all over the world. We want our culture. And it's produced a conservative backlash that's growing all the time. But we haven't resolved the question of what a global market labor market looks like, feels like. We're not sure whether nations want it. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw this just this uh, weekend, there were millions of people are marching in Germany against the idea that um, AF Day was going to basically export all immigrants. Right. They actually met in Potsdam to have a meeting. Right. And AFD is the neo-Nazi party in Germany. They met in Potsdam to have a meeting about exporting all immigrants in a direct parallel to the Potsdam conference or Wanzai conference in 1942. Right. So you've got nationalities that still aren't convinced they want to be part of a global market in the same way that was true at the end of the 19th century, where you had communities that weren't really sure they wanted to be part of a national labor market. Um, and I, I, I think this goes back fundamentally um, to the question that Daniel's been talking about uh, and the question that you asked about the progressive voice in this, right? Um, because the, the progressive voice is a voice that is wanting that cipher kind of freestyle, Right to reimagine possibilities because it doesn't like the choice of national or global labor market. Because look, if I'm a worker, I lose on either of those equ equations. Right? If I'm a working class kid growing up, who cares whether it's a national labor market or a global labor market? Right? Like I'm just a commodity. Right? So that so they're wanting to create new spaces of identity that are not market based. Right? That are not about my role as capital. Um, and you see that a lot in um, in rap in particular, right? They're um they're very and I'm not a rap expert at all. I'm an old punk rocker, but um, but you saw that sort of in the in the punks in the 70s and 80s also, right? Um but it ties in um with this question of you know creativity and, and like Ultimately, the structure for education moving forward is a network and not a bureaucracy, okay. right? Uh, there's a woman whose work I really love named Julia Freeland Fisher, uh, and she wrote a book called Who You Know, right, that argued that the significant gap in education is not opportunity, it's not skills, it's networks, right? A person who has no network becomes a commodity. Right. And we don't do anything in schools to educate kids about networks. Right. Everything is about their individual responsibility. As Daniel said, it's are you a good student? Are you a good teacher? Are you a good principal? Right. The idea that anybody in our school system could participate in a network is anathema to that system. Right. Um, and and but the kids who rise out are not the kids who are the smartest or the most creative. They're the kids with the networks. Right. And most of those networks are usually tied to their families. Right. Um, which isn't any different than the Middle Ages. Right. Um, quite honestly. But I, but I think that question of like, how do we get an education system that is network based, but still fulfills the. the I think what is an essential role in democracy, the sense of making us feel like we're all even though we're part of different networks, we're part of the same citizenry. We get along, right? Because I think there are some market-based solutions to education that are actually a direct threat to democracy, right? Because they make us feel like we're part of a special group or separate, and we don't need to care about everybody else. So I think that's the real challenge is how do we make this networking work um, without all of us going into our social media bubbles and yelling at each other? And I'll stop there. Well, well, first off, I'm indebted to you for all the book titles and suggestions. I'm always looking for new new work. So I really appreciate that. Second, yeah. um, you know, a few things come to mind. You know, Sheldon Woolen, who was a great Tocqueville scholar, I think, well, he sure. talks a lot 
about democracy as event, where there's be really been very rare examples of democracy. There's been events of it, and then it's mm -hmm. kind of gone away. And But the problem is, because there's been events, it's easy to say, oh, that's what we do, when the process is then nothing like democracy in those moments of events. I do think something similar happens kind of with capitalism, where there are these moments of innovation and explosion, and you go, oh, that's what capitalism does. But it's more like, um, you know, Dietrich Mikhailsky says we almost need a new word for those periods than capitalism, like mm -hmm. creationism. You know, well, that sounds like creationism, but like creativityism or something. These moments of an explosion of innovation would seem to be the key that she points out as a historian is that's true. Well, air conditioning, heating, water, you know, those are the things that improve the quality of life of the human being, not pieces of paper, equity, and all of these other things. Now, right. it gets into the question of the exchange. But what happens, he says, is in capitalism, you lose sight of the goalpost, if you will. You gradually s stop asking, what are the conditions that arise to this creativity that everyone can benefit from and become, how do we create capital and how do we create capital markets? Well, that's that's, and then you legitimize the creation of those capital markets based on the kind of mythos or the story of the explosion of creativity. Right. So there's a kind of, in the same way that you can um, justify the current American voting, you know, structure or political system by the events, the moments of democracy that Willen talks about, losing sight of the fact that the system no longer actually reflects that. So there's a delicate balance here that requires education or ways of mm -hmm. thinking to notice the change, which if you're not taught those different ways, you're 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 not able to identify when a category is misapplied. Like basically the very skill to identify that, wait a minute, this word is being used in a way different than how it once was made or used to say this historic period is the same as a past one, but maybe it's not. Well, that's not on the test. You just need to tell me if it's capitalism or not, not if it's a misapplied terminology right. for different historic realities. That's an entirely different way of thinking that, dare I say, is more creative because it's not so bound to the direct right. trivia cocktail party thing or anything like that. Tim, did you want to say something, sir? I just wanted to cut in for a minute because I think you touched on something that's really important about the structure of our education, right? And this connects to the dissertation I wrote, but um, the you know, the archetypical American textbook today is, especially of history, is like shovel sort paragraphs with some key sentences with bold words in them, right? And we assess reading on the ability of a student's ability to read questions at the end of that section of the textbook and use the statements in bold to answer the questions, right? And that's not reading at all, right? That's copying and pasting, right? But that creates a... a a very strong consensus. If a kid says, well, but there was this other thing over here that wasn't in bold that I thought was really interesting and I want to talk about, they're going to get a wrong answer, right? Because the job is to find the words in bold and use them to come up with answers, right? Um, and that is part of that like structural mindset framing that anybody who questions that the words in bold might actually be the answers to the questions of the book is not just creative, right? But is actually a troublemaker, yeah. right? They're, they're actually not following the algorithm the way they're supposed to. And let's be honest, that's really all chat GPT and artificial intelligence does, right? Is it looks for the words of bold in billions of documents, even if they're not in bold, and it pulls them and tells you, this is the answer, right? And like, so we've, we've not only, you know, eliminated what used to be called reading prior to the advent of public education in the world. Um, but we're also now have created a robot that will massively produce that notion that this is the only kind of reading is reading a book to find the answers that you're supposed to find to answer the questions that the author asks you later. And that's what scares the shit out of me about chat GPT, right? Is like, it, it's a massive reinforcer for the mindset that you're talking about um, that reinforces that everything is a transaction, right? Look, I found this, I engaged in the right of acquisition and I grabbed it out of the textbook and I put it where it belongs. I must be a great citizen, right? <laughs> well, what, what, I mean, what you're saying right there, you know, this is why I'm extremely sympathetic to Mr. Nick Land to basically be like artificial intelligence is the logical end of the logic of capital, which is exchange logic that then reaches a point of ma like basically for Nick Land, it's like, well, that's the end of humanity. But here's the key. This is where Nick Land for me poses a giant question mark. It poses an end to humanity as defined according to that logic. <laughs> 
So, right. but if that's not the only type of logic by which the human can operate, then AI is simply actually freeing us from the logic of capital to then do the logic of what is more human, which would align, I'll say, with the cipher mentality that we were saying earlier. But here's the great problem. As AI develops from Mr. Land to become this kind of logical manifestation of the logic of capital that Marx talks about, ergo the logic of exchange, ergo the ultimate cocktail guest, then if you along the way lose the capacity to even realize there are other ways of thinking, then what could be the saturation point to call us to a different way of thinking instead becomes the end of thinking. It's kind of like Bereke was saying the end of humanity in a dismal sense. But for Mr. Land, basically, it is the end of humanity. But, you know, it's like what Dr. Viveki was saying on the idea that the key is for us not to look at AI and say, that's how human intelligence works, but instead to say that is a kind of intelligence that right. is not the sum of human intelligence, but just a different mode. And this is where metaphors matter, right? Like I think about Seal talking about how we really got to be careful before we start saying the brain is a computer, because if we Absolutely. use that metaphor, then actually when a computer shows up, we say, well, that's all the brain can do. And then we give up right? We roll over. Yeah. And so this is where the AI is a kind of, you know, as Mr. Luber and Alex talk about, it's the calls are in the story, where it forces you to ask a question. You know, you either A, give up, or B, you say, well, we have now been caused to rethink what it is to think, rethink what right. it is to be educated. So it's an opportunity precisely because it's a uh, a causer, just precisely because it's a mm. kind of terror in a way. But that's where right. it's catastrophe is opportunity. You know, you hear that in Japanese, Latin and different things like that. So I think also, too, what AI also does is, well, a way I think about, because you talked about the medieval education, et cetera, so forth. You know, what's always interesting is that when you look at children in medi medieval art, they're not really, they're little adults, right? They're right. not actually like immature. And what ended up happening is that education, I think Ivan Illich is quite good on this, for most of history until like the beginning of the 18th, 19th, you know, with all of that, is that being educated was to be able to subsist, to subsistence society, to be able to take care of your home and really to learn how to participate in the cosmos, but like in terms of God's creation, being part of the divine, et cetera, so forth, and your community. So education was much more tied to a question of participation, whereas education today is much more tied to a question of exchange. How do you exchange something? And we've actually conflated the categories of exchange and participation in the same way that we've conflated the categories of stimulate and create. These are not the same thing. Stimulating demand is not the same as creating demand, but when you read econ papers, they use those back and forth. Likewise, in the medieval mind, every because the issue that also started to happen, and Neil Postman talks about this with the death of childhood, and the idea that to be an adult now is to be literate. It means you're able to read. Well, what is it? Why do we? But of course, how do we define reading? Well, it's like Tim was saying, right. according to trivia, this is not reading. Because reading in a deeper sense is learning how to participate as a full, a full human being in reality, community, cosmos, relationships, et cetera, so forth. So becoming an adult became becoming literate and literate meant being good at trivia. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means until, this is the key. In the medieval mind, a child was just as much of an adult as an adult because everyone was in a position to always already participate in the community and the cosmos. Now, you don't participate till you have a what? Job. So children are immature. Right. They're undeveloped because they're not at the place yet where they can participate in the market. Therefore, they can't participate in anything. And, you know, quote unquote. And then therefore, right. they're... They're not even like human, actually, in a weird way. I mean, that's a little far. But in the medieval mind, right. a child was a little human. Like they were a little adult because everyone is always already positioned to participate in the community, the family, to participate around the house, societies yeah. of subsistence, as they like put it. But now you're not really able to participate in anything until you get a job, which means you become intelligible to the system, according to right. exchange, which means you're captured, as Deleuze puts it. And that means you're now participating in the cosmos because the cosmos is the market. And so this is right. this is the and so education changes to reflect that. Whereas education when you're younger is, hey, you're always already participating in the cosmos. So here's the books and here's how you read to be able to be part of that enchantment, as Charles Taylor talks about. 
Now it's like, hey, you're not actually human yet until you get a job. So we're going to get you to the place where you're good at it is at exchange so that you can be human. But of course, that definition of human is mm -hmm. defining artificial intelligence as human. And so you're artificiated as a human being, which means you're right. just set up to be replaced by artificial intelligence. And to close the point, as you know, Tim was bringing up slavery and different things, basically, if you don't open up possibilities of thought, there always has to be some artificiated labor force in your society, whether it be the slaves who are artificiated human beings or it's going to be AI, it's really what you see is the logic of artificiation, ergo alienation, is just right. continuing into AI. And basically the idea is, well, now AI is going to be able to do all the jobs that we don't want to do so that we're free to talk philosophy and all that. We'll have our slave class, basically. But this is okay because, you know, they're not human, so it's not immoral, right? So it's a continuation of that logic, which then I do actually think, you know, this gets into like the Civil War debate in America between capital and basically unjust leisure time, where we have leisure by having a slave class. But then the alternative is capital, where everyone is reduced to the logic of capital. And that is a problem we've actually not thought through very well. Right. But, we, but we're like, oh, we're going to solve it now with artificial intelligence. Here's the problem. Um, artificial intelligence, if it frees you from labor and you're not able to think, though, outside the logic of labor, your free time is going to be what? Boredom in hell. It's going to be anxiety producing because you're not able to think creatively with your free time to actually yeah. use it in a humanizing way. This is the great fallacy in the logic. If everyone is freed by AI to do whatever they want to do, but they're not able to think beyond the logic of interacting with people as capital and themselves as capital, then it's actually going to possibly be a giant torture. And that's right. where like you read the history of boredom following Patricia Sachs book. You look at all the mental health crisis, like like Freud and Lacan and all those warn you that anxiety and mental health problems tend to correlate with first world nations. Well, that makes no sense. Well, what if first world nations tend to create a mode of thinking of exchange that makes it more difficult to be human? So then when you have freedom, freedom just becomes a place to be tortured by your inability to use that freedom in a human way. So we've yeah. really got a problem. And then I'll close the point. Like if we're going to have AI do all the stuff that Close we it. don't, you know, that <laughs> we don't want to do. I've got to jump on this. I've got to jump on this. You know, so if we as humans yeah. are going to let AI do all the stuff to have freedom, then we have to have the mode of thinking human so that this freedom is not a torture for us. And that's an educational issue. That's where yeah. mode, that's where education has to be reformed to be ready for that. Yeah. Well, very well said, Daniel. Thank you, Tim. No, thank you. Thank you both. This is an absolute like tour de force. Uh, so many different threads and I almost I had a sense that this conversation wasn't going to be a, a tightly bound one because it touches on so many things and your knowledge also touches on so many uh, domains and I think it's really powerful now that we're kind of arriving at this AI question because it it's kind of spooky um, it's hard to gauge the depth of change that's coming and at times it just kind of fades out of awareness altogether it's like is anything really happening at all and then at other times i sit into this conversation space and people really think in the sense of like real thinking of philosophy of drawing distinction and thinking these things through it feels kind of like a tidal wave is is coming through and it's going to affect everything and change everything and it's definitely going to be absolutely devastating to those systems of education that are based on simulated thinking as you so put it and generations of students have gone through and seen their creativity rejected and and uh unmet but now this ai wave is going to be um particularly devastating and as we're going through this i feel myself bouncing back again like oh, to what i was noticing in those churches and it's also, it's not just that the churches are utilizing the creativity of the youth. It's that it's such a novel thing for me to see that. And when I'm seeing it, I'm like, wow, what is this? Like, I've never seen this thing before that's not a school and not a university and somehow is like drawing upon all the creative capacity of the people involved, albeit with, you know, an underlying groupthink dynamic that probably has to be contended with a great deal. Um, alongside this, I wanted to flag briefly one, um, info bit that you brought in, Tim, which is the, uh, the conference, uh, in Germany 
because I, I've spent a few years in Germany, as you know, and I got to observe some of the internal political dynamics and the relationship between the institutional uh, technocratic class in Germany and mm -hmm. the German people is one in which um, basically any possibility of an opposition to the governing uh, way of organizing things that emerges that is not progressive uh, identitarian kind of uh, resistance, which is to, to a degree being co-opted. The other side of it is completely blocked out as far right. And there's a degree of, there's a great deal more ambiguity, I think, in a lot of these instances, whether it was during the COVID years or with these farmers that are going out on right. strike. And in, indeed with this conference is definitely uh, evidence of a particularly extreme Austrian uh, person advocating like wholesale deportation kind of thing. And then there's a lot of people who are in a position that's not that, that is more to do with um, people who are not citizens in Germany uh, or people who are migrants in Germany and so on and so forth. Um, and there's plenty to disagree with that. But what I notice is a, a manufacturing of a story about what's going on there by journalists and by political leadership, which recreates this condition of dangerous thing over there, can't have that kind of resistance. Therefore, we need to kind of like batten down the hatches and stay with this thing. And uh, something in that, which is far beyond the scope of this conversation, feels it feels like part of the 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 kind of trap we're in it's like we're both we're like we're we're two two people like wrestling each other on the edge of a cliff um unable to kind of like break free of the bind and get to this space of actually maneuvering out of the deadly the deadly problem into the creative space and that's where i think philosophy is an enormous gift and i think these kinds of conversations are an enormous gift so uh, I just want to chime in on what you said early in your remarks, um, Jacob, because I'm very skeptical that AI breaks the system. In fact, I'm pretty confident based on what I see in the field that AI is just going to reinforce the system of education um, uh, and produce the problems that Daniel is talking about, more mental health, more anxiety, right? Uh, because AI makes the work of teachers infinitesimally easy they're overburdened right now and being over judged because of their failure to reproduce capital right um and so they're looking for an easy solution and um i mean there's a reason i'm sitting here talking to you on a monday morning rather than out in the field doing work with schools around the united states uh because teachers are eating that crap up and as someone pointed out to me yesterday you know we are dealing with a generation of teachers now, at least in the United States, who were educated by No Child Left Behind, right? They were educated by this uh, trivia and test mentality, right? They don't think it should be any different than this because it's the way they were educated. Whereas myself, uh, I have no idea how old Daniel is. I know you're a little bit younger, Jacob. Um, you know, we actually still grew up in a world that believed in hermeneutics, right? Like, uh, whether it was biblical hermeneutics or Gadamerian hermeneutics or whatever, we actually believed you could look at a text and think through it rather than just be like, there's the answer, I'll take it, right? Um, and I do want to add one thing is I, you keep bringing up the communities of the church, and I think it's important as a solution to this, right? Um, because the, the solution to the problem of education in our late capitalist world is not going to come from education, it's going to come from a rival structure that rises up in the same way that the crisis that we're talking about to a certain extent is a crisis that the West saw at the end of the Roman Empire also, right? You had a remarkably successful system that ossified, right, um, that began to treat everything as a commodity, right, including language, um, because you could, you know, the orators and the senators could make anything they wanted out of any words, right? It was a problem that classical Greece faced also. Um, and, you know, on one read, 
Christianity in the church was an ontological reassertion that words meant what words meant, right? I mean, John's gospel starts out with that very premise, right? Uh, that in the beginning was the word, and we're not going to debate this anymore. Words mean what words mean, and this game is over, right? And um, there were huge debates going on in what is now Israel along these lines in the Hebraic tradition, right, among Jews. Um, like the Torah had collapsed as a signifier of permanent meeting to organize society, um, which is why Jesus is constantly ridiculing the Pharisees, right, because they will do anything they want with the Torah to justify the political circumstances necessary to keep them on top. Right. They will little tell. I mean, it's like Orwell writing in 1984. Right. You know, white is black. Two and two make five, et cetera. Right. Like we can make you believe all this stuff. Um, and and there was the church became an alternative for communitarian authenticity at a time in the West when the the empire no longer made sense. Right. Um, and I think we're not far from that. I don't honestly know if it's going to be the church. Again, um, but I I do see these kinds of communities and and Lisa's entertainment lounge is part of it, right? Uh, sprouting up all over the place that are little places where people just want to be like, hey, and I really love that you use the word participate, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Right? Can we just participate together? Mm -hmm. Right. The, the book that I wrote, I played constantly with this opposition between participation and preparation. Right? The system prepares. What kids want today is a chance to participate. They don't want to wait 18 to 20 years to be prepared and get that job that Daniel talked about to participate. They want to participate now, right? And they're finding all sorts of little places where they can participate together in online communities, right? Which is why they're so addicted to their phones because online communities allow them to participate as full human beings rather than being told they're not ready to participate yet in the public school system, right? Um, and I, I think we are seeing little networks pop up in here and there where people want to be connected to one another um, as an answer, uh, but we don't know what that's going to be called yet, right? And some people will go to the church, sure, right? Because it offers that kind of community gathering. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the church effectively died in the 19th century when Nietzsche declared God was dead, right? I mean, the church's sway over large percentages of people fell apart after that. Right. I mean, you look at Europe today and maybe 25 percent of Europe believes. Right. Sincerely believes um, it's probably about 50 to 55 percent of the United States. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know if you guys know the classic 1960s book, A Canticle for Leibowitz. You know, this book, it's about a monk in Arizona after the nuclear catastrophe. Right. And he's a Catholic monk. Um, who is preserving all the knowledge of Western civilization, right, after this, you know, and it, it it's a really interesting imaginary of what would, you know, would the world go back to the church if there were a big catastrophe or not? It's a beautiful book. But um, I just, I do think, I'll go back to this, like, where do we get our identity? Right? Capitalism's answer is for us to buy it. Right? You're going to buy an identity. You're going to buy a $90,000 truck and put truck nuts on it to prove you're a man, right? And you should probably have a couple guns in the back window also. Um, but um, I think what we're really seeing is young people are hungry for a chance to participate in a dialogue that, like this, where we formulate our identity together. And you use that word, Daniel, very specifically about formulation, right? That it's not form, but formulation. It's a conversation, it's a dialogue. Um, and and to the extent that churches in Catholic South America, and there's also a wonderful book called Burning Down the House uh, about the role that the punk movement played working through churches to take down East Germany, right? Uh, to the extent that churches still provide this space for authentic com conversations where we can participate in formulating identities with each other, they'll still play a role. That's why they didn't die completely with the rise in atheism in the 19th century. But um, I, 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 you know, I, it's not going to happen in schools. I'm in a really pessimistic place right now about 
public education. And I just honestly, I think um, it's going to get worse, not better in public education. Um, so go ahead, Daniel. I no, I don't want to take this down. A deep oh, dive. no, no, no. I think, well, you know, there's a few things. I think everything you said was excellent. Again, I appreciate the suggestions. You know, there's a way in which AI should break education because it should be the revelation that this is not human, edu you know, human knowledge. But the, but the issue is that it will arguably cause, you know, I'll talk about self-effacement. What it will do is cause a condition where you have the people in power and the assumptions of how things are to try to hold on to it as much as they can, creating more of the mental illness and different things like that, which in a way is breaking because it's dysfunctional, but the system as a whole actually becomes more um, stubborn, if you will, actually, and is yeah. using and is using it. Um, again, if we take what land is teaching in a positive way, it should be a call to action. It should be a wait a minute. We need to create different modes of thinking. But unfortunately, we ourselves have been, to use Ivan Illich's term, disabled from thinking mm -hmm. according to different ways of thinking because we grew up in No Child Left Behind. Therefore, at this point, Nick Land does seem to have the high ground in the sense of, sure, yeah, AI could call you to a different alternative, but it's trained you out of the ability, the logic of capital to think to that alternative. Show, show, right. show me what you got. And I'm not bashing on Nick Land. I think Nick Land presents the challenge. I think he frames it very well because he says AI is just the logic of capital that's been gradually right. working through education, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I think too, like what you were saying with um, like the fascist, like these different groups. So that's Paul Virilio and different things. Like let's take Mr. Dugan, for example, for political theory, Russian philosophy, you know, this kind of fascist sort of notion. So all the Western media basically goes, that guy's a fascist, don't listen to him. But if you read his work, what he's actually arguing is basically that neoliberalism is the logic of capital. It reduces mm -hmm. everyone to commodity. And we've got to keep America out using a national identity to create a boundary so that the logic of capital does not get us. Well, guess what that sounds like? Um, if you read a book called The Arguments for Slavery between the North and the South during the Civil War, the South was basically arguing the North is dehumanizing everyone into factory workers. We're not going to be part of that. We're going to actually have a, a culture and yep. a humanity. And the North's like, but it's based on um, slaves. And they're like, well, at least some people have leisure up there. Everyone's a slave. Because back then, there's no difference between wage slavery and racial slavery. Now... Obviously, that's immoral and terrible, but that's the debate. And one of the problems is that capital creates a reading of history or a depiction of Dugan to where you never see the problem of capital. Because if they're just Nazis, then you don't see the problem. But if you look at the problem, basically for me, as I said earlier, the problem that we as a human race have never ever figured out, which I know is a bold statement, we figured it out maybe as hunter-gatherers going back 3,000 years ago or whatever, but as of agriculture and the development of societies and complicated globalized networks, we have never figured out the problem of leisure without it being based on injustice. The only pockets of leisure we have seen requires an artificiated class of people, rather it be on terms of race, rather it be on terms of wages, rather it be terms on technology, of which then allows people to have leisure, which is not merely free time, but a space of time energy, as Dave McCarrickter says, like a period of high energy where you can do your own creative human work. And we have never, the, the, the Civil War can be framed, I'd have to write this paper, it gets into Gary Gallagher, all those different people, as a war between capital and an unjust leisure, capital one, but right now it's still the logic of capital and we haven't figured out how to have just leisure, which is a leisure that requires a form of full humanity. People like Dugan or some of the conservative, like some of the more classical conservatives will defend culture as the space right. of um, non-market -lo non logic. Here's the problem. If you still have the logic of exchange, rather you're defending capitalism or culture, it's actually still the same mode of thought. That's why so much of this is educational. That's why Dugan, you see, because here's the problem. If you defend culture to save you from capital, but the way you think is still in terms of exchange, then what does it have to be in exchange of culture? Exchanges of right. culture are called what? War. That's how you mm -hmm. exchange culture, colonialization, dominance. The, the way you exchange culture is conflict, territory. If it's not market, it has to be something or it tends to be, you could do it through education. We're exchanging culture through conversation, but you have to have been educated to be capable of that. Ah, right. what have we not been educated to be capable of? So when you have a defensive culture, like from a Dugan, 
if it's still in the logic of exchange, then it can't be the network cybernetic, more Deleuzian sort of Lumham kind of talking, which I think you get into like your um, your uh, theory of sociological theory of intellectual change, you know, all of these different books that show the primacy of network. That's great. But if you still have a logic of exchange, you can't have that kind of interaction. Culture as network, it has to be culture as dominance or artificiation. And that's where we are right now. That is yeah. the giant, you have a you have a conflict of neoliberal capitalism versus a defensive culture in the name of leisure, but it requires an unjust lever because it has to be culture and exchange as ergo dominant. So we don't have a good solution because you cannot have a good solution to close out the point until you change the way people think. And that would require a different education. Yeah. No, and I'm 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 glad that help was helpful for me in terms of thinking about um the culture industry comments, right? The the tension that I'm seeing in progressive movements to try to change the way we're thinking are that they still are working in that commodification of culture mentality. And it becomes what Bismarck coined it as a culture war, right? The, the culture comp, um, that it's going to be a war between cultures rather than a synthesis or an, uh, even an exchange, right? We have to like fight, these cultures have to fight each other. So classical Western culture versus alternatives, et cetera. Um, and you know, I just I I think we have to point out, out the fact here um, that that we are engaged in a form of leisure in this conversation that is to some extent based on unfair relations, right? Um, and that um, in part of it, for whatever reason, I I'll close with this thought um, uh, from Young Zhao, who's an educational theorist, came out of China and now teaches at the University of Kansas. And his first book was called Catching Up or Leading the Way. And it was about the fact that China and the US were both looking at each other very seriously about their education models. And the reason was, is uh, the American education model is a mess, right? But for whatever reason, it produces entrepreneurs and patents. Right. And that the Chinese were really curious about that. And the Chinese education model is almost seamless. It produces exactly what it sets out to produce, except that it produces no innovation in patents. Right. And the two countries were sort of looking at each other, sort of passing like ships going across the Pacific, trying to figure out what to do here. Um, and Zhao's point was um, that the American educational model is broken in so many places that it can't ultimately constrain the creative thinkers. It can't, it, it it's so bad that it can't actually package everybody into it, right? Whereas the Chinese model was so perfect that it just basically, you know, flattened everybody. Um, and that Zhao's ultimate argument at the end of the book is like, don't try to fix American education because if you make it do what you think you want it to do, you will you will kill the way that it lets really creative thinkers slip through, right? Um, and a really good example of that, just to close out, right, is a lot of states now are trying to assess college majors on the basis of return on investment once you get that job that Daniel was talking about, right? And they want colleges to have to inform students, if you take this major, you can expect this amount of money when you graduate, right? So you should do that because it'll be better for you. What they're not telling anybody is that if you look at that data 10, 15, 20 years down the road, the best majors to take are the ones that pay the least money out of the gate after college. The people who study history, philosophy, humanities, right, all end up making much more money than the kid who studies to be an engineer and takes an $80,000 job as an engineer right out of college, right? Because that $80,000 job that the engineer gets first year out of college will probably continue to be an $80,000 a year job for the rest of his working life, right? It probably, or her working life, it won't change at all. But the kids who go into weird things like philosophy or sociology or that kind of stuff, right? They're constantly moving around asking interesting questions. They're in these dialogues that we're talking about, um, you know, whether it's over Zoom or coffee at a French coffee house, you know, like you name it, um, because they were opened to the kind of thinking that Daniel's been talking about all the time. And, it, you know, Zhao's argument, just to wrap up, is that 
it's because the American education system has never been able to stamp that out of everybody that the United States still has a certain creative and entrepreneurial class, right? Um, so, so sometimes our our neoliberal desire to make everything rational, and I think of Michael Okashat's famous book, Rationalism in Politics, right? Like that gets us in a lot of trouble. Like trying to come up with a rational way to educate kids, right? May actually be the most dangerous thing we can do. And maybe we're better off with a broken system than a perfect system. Beautiful. Que rico. Gracias, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I got to say, it's been a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed this so much, Tim. You're magnificent. Thank you so much for making this yeah. possible, Jacob. Goodness. Although I, I will say I didn't have anywhere near much coffee to make up for the time difference in your high energy level. But <laughs> <laughs> I need a couple more cups to get up to speed. But We're still trying to figure out what coffee he's drinking over that. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, this has been incredible. I'm so glad I brought you uh, both together and feel inspired about falling between the cracks. And um, yeah, so just such a multi-layered multi -layer cake. Yeah, yeah. One last question, Jacob, because um, I, I regret that I didn't have time to do a lot of background search. But uh, Daniel, are you teaching somewhere? Or are I you at... I, I'm at a wedding home. venue. No, I do not teach. I have three children. We live on a farm. Uh, right. so I unloaded trucks for a bunch of years at a wholesale and my wife and I run a wedding venue. So, uh, you know, I don't teach anywhere, but I have the pleasure right. of conversations such as this. So what more can a yeah. man ask for? Well, but I, I think that goes to the point, right? Is while, um, you know, the education system did not pump people like me or Daniel or you, Jacob into the education system. Right. Um, like. I used to say when I was a young academic that in a in a well-ordered society, I would be stoned to death, right? Because I challenged <laughs> so many assumptions. <laughs> and they would have just lined me up against a wall and thrown stones at me for what I was thinking and saying, right? It's René Girard and the scapegoat kind of thing. But American society lets lunatics like us run around in the crevices and corners, right? And we find each other and we... Um, and, the, and it goes back to... Um, uh, the book um, Who You Know that I was mentioning by Freeland Fisher, right? It's like the problem for so many kids who are those cipher masters that you're talking about is they don't find their network. They don't, they don't find the other crazy people to talk to, right? And so they despair out of this sense that there really must be something wrong with me. And I've wrestled with that despair my whole life. Obviously, if I think I should be stoned to death, right? I, I have some depression issues, right? Because I don't fit in. Um, but the reality is, you know, the, the modern West is one of the few places that tolerates people like us, right? Like we may not get the material success that's promised in a, you know, in a market economy, right? Um, unless we do something else like run a wedding venue or, you know, whatever. Um, but we're not persecuted, right? Um, we're not hunted down and killed, Um in a way that has been true in other societies. Um, there's this weird ability of liberal democratic societies to tolerate that rampant dissent. Um, and, I, it, you know, and you'll never be able to do this in public schools, right? But to the extent that you can help kids understand that there is that space out there beyond the walls of the school, just like hinting at it, like, don't despair. It's There's something over there. Right. And I, I think right now the people who are doing that better than anybody else are the no place for hate groups in schools that are supporting um, LGBTQ students. Right. And telling them, you know, don't despair. Like, yes, high school is incredibly gendered, incredibly straight. Right. But you'll find a place out there where there are other communities that you can be yourself. Right. And that you can engage in a dialogue about becoming yourself. And um, I guess we need a, a labor equivalent of that. Right. Like. You know, so it's it's okay to not be a commodity, right? As opposed to not be male or female. So. Well, I think it's beautifully. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll I give can't you a minute, just in a moment. Yeah, and uh, I'll say yes, nothing Daniel, more. I'll just um, stop there. Daniel, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim is uh, thrown in his thrown in his red card. Um, yeah, beautifully put, Tim. And I think that's both a uh, exaltation of what is so precious 
about the West and something that's been important to me ever since my student days, um, but also something that is fragile. And so it's not just hinting at the possibility of it. It's uh, it's kind of res- creating the resilience in our own lives and in our own networks. And that's what I feel is a really important work of the coming years is to actually create the condition where um, when Big Brother comes with the stick or the algorithmic stick or whatever it is, we actually have the resilience to preserve that space, even mm-hmm. if it's only ever a, a, you know, a little a crack uh, to preserve that crack with with all of our power and devotion and let me just say that uh, Daniel doesn't teach anywhere in the same way that Socrates probably didn't have a job at the university. Um, he, without being a teacher, he has impact on numerous, numerous, numerous people, numerous young men in particular, I think. And so uh, I've learned a great deal from him about reading and writing and speaking and these very like core um foundational essences of education which ultimately are are more important uh because they're things that you can bring through into your adult life and carry through and be a lifelong uh pursuer of wisdom so i'll leave it there and if there's uh, anything else you wanted to add no let's uh carry through on this a couple more times this spring right um let's find some other times we can connect and i you know like I'm feeling right now as a result of this conversation that Zoom is probably the greater threat to structures than AI, right? Because because precisely because it opens up these political spaces uh, where we can have real conversations as opposed to the public sphere that Habermas examined of like newspaper articles going back and forth and editorials and books, right? Like we can actually be in a public space together. So let's do this again and keep rolling. Um, first off, that's exactly right. Um, second, I would love to do it again. And third, yeah. Jacob, that's very kind and that means a lot. Thank you. And fourth, what you just said about Zoom is a big deal because I think there is a massive difference between Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Zoom. And Zoom allows the possibility in the same way that there is um, like written, you have the oral tradition, the written tradition. Zoom, it's almost like you want to talk about Zoom tradition, which is the ability of an oral recording because we can record this. We can have a kind of engagement that is not possible that in the same way that William Ong, Marshall McLuhan, all of them talked about that the medium right. of information changes how the brain work. I think Zoom could be what can change how the mind works to be able to move beyond exchange. And the liminal web, like when I look at the liminal web and these kind of conversations, this looks to me like what democracy actually is as Tocqueville is talking about, not a pro- process of voting, but a philosophical exchange. And then what's key about Zoom is it allows this kind of philosophical discussion that's not this boring, let's review the history and facts of philosophy, but a engaging in an act of formulation because we're gathered under the true, the beautiful, and the good, and we're orbiting it, thus formulating as persons and character to be more fully human, as like Mr. Schindler will talk about as he's talked about with Ken, and that's exactly right. right. Zoom allows that. And this is a different medium of the classroom that helps break down the association that being good at trivia is being smart to being able to speak and to formulate in conversation in a network is what makes us human. And you see where Instagram, Twitter allows content creation that feels like exchange currency data and different things like this. Zoom, even if you ultimately do create content, it's after a very long process of formulation. So the formulation comes first and then the content, whereas in Instagram, Twitter and all the other things, the content come forth and maybe there's formulation usually not so the more we can get kids and people engaged in the liminal web which ergo is training in friggin democracy in the right sense which is the commutative rationality of habermas which is the formulation of subjects outside the logic of trivia which then gets into the philosophical friendship that aristotle told you politics is impossible without now we are looking at an alternative that truly breaks the system in the way one hopes ai would but it probably will not it will just lead to the complete dominance of it and that could be changed because it, even precisely in capitalism's making everyone commodity thus making everyone equal as value that equal sign is why it can't get rid of us or get rid of the liminal web because yeah. we're equal you can't hey we're all on this call potential commodities so you can't get rid of us so the very equal sign of capital that makes everything equal as potential value is the very equal sign that makes it unable to get rid of the weirdos, right? Right. So that Mm -hmm. little equal sign is then the question of how do we open the space where the the weirdos talk more? That's Zoom. Zoom allows that. 
But this is, so to close, here's the point. The stakes are high and the race is on because AI is going to be closing the spaces mm -hmm. to create autonomous capital. It's going to yep. be shutting down the spaces quickly of the ability to think beyond the weirdness because AI is going to take over everything. You have a cell phone in your pocket. You literally right now could be engaged 24 seven in the logic of exchange. Even weirdos like us by using our cell phone or doing too much content or using AI too much, training us out of the ability to think in terms of philosophy, ergo being in regular gymnasiums, as Socrates would say, like this, where we're training that ability to keep AI from training us out of the ability, yeah. ability of philosophical discussion becomes incredibly critical. So Zoom, so this is it. Zoom creates the possibility of making more of these spaces outside of capital, which exists mm -hmm. because of the equal sign of capital, but AI is now here as a threat to them. Yeah. But it doesn't have to win. The question is what we're going to do. So let's have another conversation and keep it going. Yeah. So to sum up, I, I'll, I'll borrow and say that um, tune in next time when we will discuss uh, the revolution will be Zoomed. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank Beautiful. you both.